Hello. Uh, are you up? I see you have a standing desk like I do. I do. <laughs> it's really important. Uh, I spend way too many hours at this computer. Uh, um, I'm posting it again to this to the event so people can see this link. Yeah, this is nice. Um, mine just the whole thing goes up and down, so um, super helpful. I'm really into ergonomics. Um, Mine does the same. I've got the uh, an uplift desk. It's the one with uh, each leg has four legs, and each one has a hydraulic piston in it. Oh, whoa! That's fancy. <laughs> <laughs> mine's mine's manual. I just manually hold it and have to lift it. Oh. Up and down, actually, it's not even a power thing. It just you just gotta like do the curls. Um, <laughs> and I have like this giant iMac with another monitor, like all this stuff. So it gets kind of heavy. <laughs> all right, I'm trying to make sure I get, um, this stuff up here. Um, people are still joining. Good to see you, John. Hey, good to see ya. Oh, and I see Amy's with us, who's our guest. So good to see you, Amy. Welcome back. Nice to be here. Thanks. And what I can do too is um, I'll post in the chat for everyone the link that Garrett's going to use when he presents. So if you want to bring it up, you can bring up that site too. So as um, John enters, um, I'll welcome everyone back to GW Coders. Um, this is now our second week, but this will follow the more typical routine of um, how we plan to organize our time together each week in that. So we'll start out with a couple of news and announcements um, and people are welcome to share things that they've heard about that are ongoing and so forth. Um, and then we'll take a few minutes, maybe five to 10 to have someone talk about volunteer and different types of opportunities to apply coding and the skills um, to different projects and Amy Cohen from the Neishman Center is going to kick that off for us this week. Um, and then we have some other people lined up that stop in and tell us more about opportunities that are available, um, both within GW as well as working within the community. And then we'll have Garrett Eason this week um, giving kind of a show and tell about something that he uses um, a good deal in coding and that it's helpful for all of us to pick up is our skills. And then we'll break into some groups, potentially if there's time at the end to talk about other things. Um, in terms of news and announcements, um, one thing that I did learn about this week is that within the Libraries and Academic Innovation Center, they have a group called Creative Something Lab, uh, I forget now. But they offer workshops on different types of creative tools for doing things like creating AR or VR, um, as well as for creating apps, uh, 3D printing, and other things as well. Um, so they have some workshops coming up this fall. 
some are on Unity, um, which is a tool for developing environments, whether it's for gaming or whether it's for virtual reality. Um, and they'll have a couple of workshops on that, on different aspects of using Unity. Um, as well as they'll have one on Adobe XD. So for GW students and faculty, we have a, the Adobe Suite and XD is one of their products. Um, I've never used XD, but to my understanding, it allows you to do mockups of apps. So if you're thinking about creating an app, but before you go through all the efforts of building the back end of it, you can do a mock-up of the user interface and the basic functionality and see how that works and use that to um, work with potential users to see how to make improvements before you start building the back end and stuff of it. And they'll have those workshops also coming up. And I see that um, that link is now posted, Dan posted it in the discussion forum. Um, so if anyone's interested in those types of coding applications, um, then that's some useful resources and upcoming things. And then, of course, LAI has the typical Python introduction, introduction to R workshops coming up. And they'll be announcing those through our Slack channel. Um, they fill up quickly. So if you see it pop up in Slack, hopefully you're getting a little bit of a head start and you can get in there before those classes fill up. They've been filling up in four or five hours sometimes. Um, so there's a lot of demand uh, for those workshops that they're offering. Do you have any other announcements, John? Um, really, maybe only just like that we're still putting together a schedule of, of uh, sort of talks and speakers for the next weeks. So looking at our schedule, it looks like I'm on for next week, I think. <laughs> um, I <have laughs> yeah, I put you there. So. <laughs> um, so for now, I'm on next week. I guess I'll figure that out. Uh, I, I was actually thinking about doing something with Shiny apps in R, so how to build an interactive app. Um, but just a heads up for, we haven't hammered these down, but just some of the topics. Um, Ryan was going to do some demoing on how to use Google Forms and scripts. I, I'm not sure exactly what, what that's going to be yet. Um, we have... Uh, Pedram uh, Hoseni, I forgot how to say his name. Um, he works with David Broniatowski and um, is going to be presenting some work on Twitter and COVID. So they pull Twitter data and they track um, sort of social media response around COVID. Um, Michael Mann is going to be doing some stuff with um, geospatial visualizations. We have a web scraping with Jasmine Sani. So we have a bunch of stuff coming up. Um, so those are some topics I, I think that, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna hammer out the schedule. So eventually, all these things will show up on the website of upcoming events. But that's if anyone's topics. interested, just drop us a note if you have something that you want to share. Um, maybe something that you've enjoyed creating. It can be um, from the very basic to something somewhat complex. Probably not super complex, but. Um, if you have things that you think others would benefit from. And it can be either a show and tell, like this is what I did and here is what it does for us. Um, or if you want to make it more of a learning one where people can code along with you and try it out, we have the tools for doing that. So with that, um, if there aren't any other announcements. I'll turn it over to Amy to talk a little bit about some of the opportunities that the Neishman Center has. Um, and she can introduce people who aren't familiar with the Neishman Center as to what it does for the university and the community. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, and it's wonderful that um, we also have uh, Ruben who's worked with the Neishman Center over the years. Um, is here and can be a resource, or he was here. Um, and uh, Natalia, who is a teacher at Wilson now, um, is a, an alum of the National Center as well, so um, can provide some ongoing um, connection. Um, so the National Center is GW's central hub for all things community engagement and civic engagement. Um, we, I, I should have brought a PowerPoint. Um, and I can send you one as well. 
Um, but we, we do co-curricular service. That is, we have students who are tutoring and mentoring in DC public schools. Um, and we are working with other nonprofit organizations, usually with young people. So we work with the y YWCA um, to do some mentoring. Um, and we work with other nonprofits. We have an art program um, in Ward 8 where we work with young people and adults um, in fine arts. Um, and I think there's some opportunities there to do some work. Um, we also work with courses all across GW um, who use um, who use the community as part of their curriculum. Um, so they may work with a nonprofit organization or a school or government agency to produce evaluation and research um, or to do some um, additional research that they don't have the chance to do. Um, we also are the voting people at GW, which is occupying a lot of my energy and time as we um, go into the lead up for this presidential election. Um, I think there are a number of ways that we can work together. I think they've all got to, we've all got to figure out how those things go. But one request I had today, um, and it's probably, it may not work for 20, uh, 2020, um, but one of the schools we work with um, talked about how they created an app for students to be able to demonstrate their home addresses or their school addresses, excuse me, um, when they go to vote. So the University of New Hampshire has a lot of students um, who are there and they want to go and vote um, locally and they are able to use their campus addresses um, through this app. Um, so there's, a, there's opportunities to do things with voting, again, probably for the next set of elections um, as we develop these. Um, but we also have, we are partnering um, with the Black Student Union this semester on a new project. Um, that project is looking at um, how to rethink and reformat DC police um, and how to look at um, diverting young people into positive youth development kinds of programs. Um, we are doing this in partnership with the Metropolitan Police. And so there are, I imagine that there are a number of data sets that they will have um, that they will need some work done on. We're meeting with them. Uh, for the first time this fall next week. Um, so I'm, I'll present to them opportunities, but I would guess that they have real need to look at their data, but also to um, connect up um, what they're doing. One project that I've been trying to fix for 10 years um, may come to this group. Um, we have seven partners with whom we work to do tutoring and mentoring. And I've been trying to figure out what difference it makes that GW students are in that project, are in those projects. Um, each of our nonprofit partners manages their data differently and manages their outcome data, that reports their outcome data differently. So some do it based on um, grades that students get, some do it based on test performance. And so I would love to figure out how to develop a project that will help us to see what difference the 100, 150 GW student tutors make in those seven programs. Um, there are tons of other projects. We work with a consortium across the region um, who, when I mentioned I was talking to you all, um, started to spin and create new projects. Um, but I would love to talk with, with anyone who is interested in working on uh, social justice issues and see how we can uh, connect them to those to those projects and uh, work on new things. So I'd love to work with you. Interesting Great, thanks questions. so much, Amy. Um, and if people are interested, what's the best way to get in touch with you? I will put my email in the chat as well as our website. Um, and that's the best way to reach me. Um, and So you can e email me at abcohen or uh, serve.gwu.edu. The, the other thing I will I'll say one more thing, and that is that we are partnered with DC Public Schools. Um, not all of them, there's a lot, um, but we have partners, pretty close partnerships with maybe five or six. Um, and if there are projects we can do with the students or with managing DC Public Schools data, 
um, we'd love to, to figure that out as well. Great. Sounds like there's some useful opportunities. Hopefully we can make some connections um, and we'll try to create something we hadn't really talked too much about, but something within the website um, potentially. We do have in our Slack, there's a Slack channel for volunteer opportunities and we can post them there as well. Uh, and I think we currently have about 100 people in the Slack channel who are interested in coding and applying coding in some way. So that might be another good place that we can make these opportunities available as they come about um, to this community that we're trying to build. That's fabulous. And I'm happy to come back and talk to people at any time. Wonderful. Okay, so with that, um, we'll turn it over to Garrett. Um, if you haven't yet opened up the deep note link that's in the chat room, you may want to do that. You don't have to, you can just follow along and watch. Um, but if you want to see, you can also create, if you're in deep note, you can create your own folder um, or your own file, I guess, more specifically. Um, or I can create ones for you if you would. I'm still not quite sure exactly how it always works. Um, you may have to sign in to have the ability to create folders, but that should be fairly quick. If you wanted to actually try doing some of it along with Garrett. So, so I think with that, we'll turn it over to you, Garrett, and you can screen share or whatever you have planned. That sounds good to me. Uh, screen sharing has been disabled by the hosts. Uh, I guess you might want to introduce yourself while he changes that over. That sounds good to me. Uh, hello, everybody. I am Garrett. I am um, a PhD student here at George Washington University in the HTC program under Ryan Watkins. Uh, let's see if I can share this. I think it's, is it this window? Nope, it's not that window. Let's see here. That looks right to me. Oh, it does? Oh, this is my whole screen. Okay, cool. All right, so everybody can see what I'm doing here. You can see me clicking on this stuff. Yep. Okay, cool. So today I'm planning on doing my talk about regular expressions. Um, hopefully this is appropriate. I was initially planning to do this on Dask, but Ryan was like, whoa, 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 hold on, slow down. So I'm gonna do it on regular expressions today. I guess if popular demand demands, we could maybe revisit that in the future. Um, but for today, today, I'm going to be focusing on regular expressions. So regular expressions, reg X's, are basically a special string that can be used to identify patterns in text. So the main idea here, you want to use reg X's to match text. Um, um, basically, most, most programming language have a reg X package that's a compiler that can be used to um, match these very specific, you'll, they'll look kind of crazy, I'll show you, but the specific set of code. So the way I like to think about it is regular expressions are typically, um, it's like a sub code, a sub language within your main language. So in Python, we have this um, import RE here that allows us to um, use regular expressions in Python, but you can also have it in other languages. So these general ideas are pretty much the same um, across any languages that have a regex package, but the syntax might be mildly different. So I gave you guys a cheat sheet here. You can just go find anyone online that you want. But if I open this up, you can see, I'm not gonna go through this at this point, I'll talk about it as we go through the rest of the uh, talk today, but um, this will, you can always come back to reference like all the stuff that I'm talking about on any of these cheat sheets. The many are available online. Um, some of the highlights um, I'll talk about just real briefly are, you can see you have these different characters that are going to identify different, um, um, different patterns in text. And you can combine these all in all sorts of different ways to match stuff really, um, you know, really easily and it's a pretty powerful, powerful technique to use. So another website I wanted to show you guys, just so you know it exists, is this online regex tester and debugger. Um, so if you go over here and you click Python, you can, you know, 
have any string you want in here, and then you can try to match um, using a regular expression. And so what this does is this will allow you to test out all this crazy stuff that you write with the actual, you know, a test string that you're looking at. It'll give you all sorts of information on that. And you can see here it has another, you know, nice little reference area. So actually talking about regular expressions in Python, like I said before, you can just uh, use the package RE. So we import RE. Um, there's three main ways of searching using this RE package. There's RE match, RE search, and RE find all. Just be aware that these are very different because sometimes people will make the mistake of using RE match and they won't realize that what they really want is find all or search. So a good example is, is here, RE match, what it will do is it will look through some text, but only from the beginning. So let's say I want to, I want to match consumer price index here. Well, if I use match, it won't match this part of regex that I give it. And so it will fail, but search will look through the entire string and return the first thing that it finds. So if I'm looking for consumer price index here without all this stuff, I could use RE search. I could use RE find all, which is basically the same thing, but will return all consumer price index throughout the text. So just be aware that these are different um, and we'll go through each one in a moment. So here's some examples. Um, Let's say I gave you uh, a excerpt from some 19, a 1980 presidential de debate um, broken down by paragraphs. So what I do is I take, took these, put them into a list of these different strings here. Okay, so this is just a nice string list. Then I'm going to for loop across this list. And now I'm going to actually use the um, regular expression um, package. I call it here and I'm using this match uh, method like we have up here. So this is gonna look at the beginning of the string. And then this right here is my actual regex. Notice the R for R raw strings. If you guys aren't aware of raw strings, this basically says that um, report, or it just uh, gives you all the literal characters that are in there. So we'll ignore things like escapes for backslash, backslashes. Um, this is important to always do this when you're doing a regex because you don't want like a, a new line indicator with slash in to mess up your regex. So what this regex is saying, let's break this down. From what we had before, this is saying we have these brackets. This signifies a set of symbols. So what I'm saying here is I'm saying in these brackets, um, I want all capitalized letters, A through Z. And in these curly brackets, that goes Can back. Can you zoom in by chance? Can you? Yeah. I'm not sure if on your Is this computer. better? Let me try and make this. How's this? I have a really large screen, so it might mess up on everyone else's screens. Yeah, it looks really small now. It went least, to my new. So let me try and make this. The other one was OK. It was working. Oh, yeah, that's big now. How's this? Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks. Okay, I'll make it even. Okay, so what this is saying is the saying match all capitalized letters A through Z. Um, and these brackets are uh, indicating like this is a single unit. And then this is saying match one to three of them. So you can match one capitalized letter, two capitalized letters, or three capitalized letters any of those options. So this first piece here, right here, is going to match something like MR. It'll match THE, it'll match this capital B here, it'll match the capital I, it'll match all of this stuff. So then the rest, the next step is I have an escape character with a dot in here. This portion of the regex is saying match exactly a dot. Okay, and I have an escape character because a dot is a special um, symbol inside of regex, um, which means like any character. So I don't want to match any character. I want to match the literal dot. So now this regex is saying match, uh, let's highlight this here, match um, capital letters, one to three of them, and then there can be a dot, but there can only be between zero and one dot. Okay, so there can't be like a bunch of dots. 
there can only be zero and one. So this whole thing right here will match something like M Mr. Dot. Um, it'll actually match the president because the president will match these three and then there's no dot given the zero here. So now you can see that based on this first part of this regex, I'll, I can match MR. It will not match because, because there's a lowercase here. Um, it'll match the, it'll match uh, Mr. And then actually it will technically match because, or it'll just match this B here. But to rule out this B, what I'll do is I'll add this slash S. The slash S indicates a space. So now we're matching, uh, we can match MR dot, we can match the, we can match, uh, it will not match because, because there's no space here, right? So it'll match the space, MR dot space, et cetera. And then the last thing I add is this, which is the same thing before, except I have a plus. This plus indicates one or any amount. So it can't be zero. And this says one or any amount of capital letters. So now we're matching the, we have the space and then any amount of capital letters, which would give us Mr. President, it'll give us Mr. Ellis and it'll give us Mr. Smith. Okay, so that's what the regex is doing. The rest of this is just um, making sure that only one element is being placed in the list at a time. So if I run this notebook, you can see we're getting out of this whole text. We've used match to find the first matches of Mr. Ellis, the president and Mr. Smith. It doesn't match any of these other lines that don't have, that don't start with a speaker or start with an indicator of who the speaker is. Now, obviously, you know, this is kind of convoluted. Um, I could easily just take this whole string, join them together. So now I just have one giant blob of string. This is like if you're just gonna take a, take a news article and just say, this is just one string. I, I plop it into Python and then I can do the same thing here. So if I, if I show you this string, this is just the long version of this. And then now I can do the same thing, but I'm gonna use find all instead of match. And then I'm going to uh, just set the speakers and put it back into a list. This will give me um, one of each. And then if I run this, you can see it's doing the same thing. It gives me the same results, but on the entirety of the uh, string. So instead of having to for loop or do any of this complicated stuff. And so what this is doing, the find all, it's doing the, uh, it's matching similarly to match. But the difference is, is that it's going through and finding every instance that's in this string uh, right down here. So every instance that matches, it'll give me that. And it'll return, it will return Mr. Ellis, Mr. Smith, and Mr. President, all of them. And then I set this, like I said before, so that we'll only have the unique versions of that, of each one of these elements, and then put it into another list again, just to get the same thing. So that's the general idea of a regular expression. There's one example of how to use one. Um, another example is let's say you had a whole bunch of information, you wanna pull out an email address. Well, here I just have a, I use an RE search. And what a search is going to do is it's only gonna, it will search the entirety of the string, but it'll only return the first element that it locates. So in this case, I only have one email address. I don't have two that I'm looking for. If I had two, I would have to use find all. So I have one, I'm going to use search. This is my regular expression. I just give it the string and um, this is the output here. Now you'll notice uh, we can kind of walk through this again and I'll explain. This is saying there has to be inside of these brackets, these parentheses here is saying that it can be lowercase a through Z, um, any number from zero through nine, an underscore, a dot um, or a dash. Uh, and there has to be one or more. Now, notice these parentheses I put around this whole thing, that indicates a group. So what I can do with these groups now is I can grab different portions of the matching, okay? So I match the entirety of the email, but let's say I just want, um, I just want the first portion before the at sign. I can grab that with search, um, which is saved as an object here, dot group one. Um, and for example, this, the last group here, group three, which is indicated by these parentheses, that's behind 
this period here, it will give me everything that's uh, in this third group, which is indicated by the com. Um, so that's like if you want to know if it's .com or if it's org or whatever. And then obviously you can say, for example, um, search group two, and that'll give us um, give me just a second. I don't know why that's not working. Oh, sorry. I didn't run these in sequence. Okay, so this is giving me the actual domain name of where it's located here by just calling the second group. So there's another example about how you can use these regexes. Let's say you have a list of phone numbers. So here's my string. I have all these phone numbers. I wrote out this long regular expression. Feel free to ask any questions while we're going through this about any of these things. It looks kind of crazy, but if you break down all the components, it becomes very clear, I think. Um, you know, when you just look them up using a, uh, uh, either a regex tester or one of those cheat sheets. But when I run this thing, um, this will go through. It'll this this time I'm using find all to find all the phone numbers, and um, you can see here I run this. It gives me the full matches, and then I can call each one of these because it's a list. The output is a list, so I can, for example, grab the first phone number, or I can grab the last phone number, or any phone number in between that I'm interested in. Um, you can also um, assign regular expressions to objects. So this is a little bit different way of writing it. This is usually pretty useful if you're gonna use a particular regular expression a lot. Um, so here's an example where I have a sentence, just some random sentence, 8% of 25 is the same as 25% of eight, et cetera. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, all right, I want you to match um, any digit, so that's slash D, one or more times with a percent sign. Okay, so I am using compile, already compile, to compile this regular expression into a, a, an object itself. Then once I have this object, I can take this object and then call the methods that we're familiar with on that object. So I'll say, all right, pattern, this particular pattern that I have, I want you to find everything that matches this pattern inside of this sentence here. And that gives me the 8% and the 25% inside of this sentence. You can see these are the only percentages. Um, I can also do something like taking the same object, I can sub in something else instead. So if I ran all these things, oops, that's the whole notebook. Uh, if I run each of these, you can see that uh, it'll replace um, what it matched, which was 8% and 25% with this blank percent. So now it becomes sort of like a question. Um, you can also split things however you want. So let's say you have a bunch of information and you want to split, you know, it's one big blob of text, but you want to split it up across um, paragraphs like we had up here. Um, in this situation, if you want to get something like this out of this, you could break it up by, for example, a new line characters. So instead of having an and here, you could have a new line character, input that sentence, and then that will give you a broken up, um, a broken up list of strings. Here's a, this example is just I use this uh, string up here, and I broke it up into the two clauses using and. So what this does, it says, all right, find and in this sentence, and break up this sentence into smaller, um, smaller strings, and put them in a list. And that's the output here. Um, one thing that's really really useful is you don't have to just match um, or the output that you gain from using regular expressions. It doesn't have to be what you match. You can match on something else and then return um, something else that's uh, using what was matched. So what I mean by this is that here I'm going to use a look behind statement. That's this question mark arrow sign equals. I'm gonna say, look behind any digit you find, followed by a dot, followed by a space. So what this is doing is it's saying, okay, if I find a digit, 
followed by dot followed by space give me and this dot without a backslash means anything that's uh, one or more. So this says, I'm gonna match this one here, but I'm going to return everything behind the one, uh, regardless of what it is. So now when I run this, you'll notice I can convert from this thing here down to here. This is particularly useful for things like, um, you know, if you, if you have, uh, you have some digit, but you want to call, uh, let's say you have, you're looking for, um, you're looking for what the denomination of some currency is, right? And you can find the current, you can find the numbers, the digits that indicate the actual value of the currency. So like $50, but you want that dollar sign or you want USD. You don't want, you don't actually, the actual amount doesn't matter. We can get the dollar sign of the USD by using these look behind or look forward um, statements. And that's pretty much all I got. So hopefully someone learned at least one thing and let me know if everybody really just wants to learn Dask. That's all. <laughs> He's promoting Dask as you can tell everyone. It's awesome. Um, so thanks Garrett. Uh, big round of applause. Um, so I was excited that Garrett wanted to present on this and I'll turn it over for questions in just a minute. Um, but I was excited to, I thought this was a good way to kick off because regular expressions, as he said, are used across different languages. So if you're in R or if you're in Python or if you're in some other, um, regular expressions are common. Um, I know like even when you're setting up websites, even if you're not doing a lot of the coding, if you're have to change the HT access file, um, you'll come across regular expressions and you probably have wondered what is all that garbly gook? Um, and now hopefully we have some idea and thanks for putting up the regular expressions 101. Um, that's very useful. So with that, we'll turn it over to questions for a little bit. Um, so Garrett, is one of my students, as he said, and he's taken a couple of courses in NLP. Um, and so that's where a lot of this obviously gets applied. I think anyone can unmute. So if you have questions, just unmute yourself and have at it. Hopefully that means everyone has mastered this material or maybe already had it mastered. <laughs> oh, and it looks like um, there's a recommendation. Dan, do you want to just turn on your mic? Yeah, sure. Um, I just this week taught the uh, Intro to Python workshop, and I was re reminded myself of uh, how, how you can use a set structure in Python which is, it's like a list, but the elements have to be unique. Yeah. So that can save you, you know, that can kind of make your code a little bit more elegant around, it was kind of up near the top there, where you're building up the matches uh, in the, the top cell there. And probably in another place as well. Yeah, using sets can be uh, very useful because one main reason they're really useful is because you can take a list and you just immediately get out all of the unique elements of that list, you know, assuming that they're like strings or numbers or something. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I tend to by default go for a list, but I sometimes forget that sets have that nice um, attribute where the elements are unique, even if you try adding a duplicate. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess we'll take just another minute or two to um, on the topic. But do you want to talk a little bit, Garrett, maybe about how you use this in the NLP work you do? Um, I use it because it's like a really easy way to extract information from text um, where possible. Um, I find it really, really useful for things like log files, um, you know, I've done some work with the CFTC. So that's the U.S. Commodities and Futures Trading Commission. 
um, where, for example, they'll get a log file from, you know, um, some trader that has been transacting and hidden within that log file is everything that the trader has been doing, but it's just a bunch of like code that's been output by the banking system or whatever trading firm system they have. And so you have this log file and it's just this, just, just text of like all these different things that are happening um, at their trading firm. And so you want to go in and find, all right, well, I need to find this trader and I need to find um, some specific things that that trader was doing um, that we're looking for that might indicate um, illicit behavior. And so I've used, for example, these regu regular expressions uh, quite a bit in that type of work where you'll just say, all right, I have a log file. Uh, I just need this person and I need to find uh, this string of code because I know when that is executed that they're probably doing something a little weird. And that allows me to quickly find the parts of these gigantic log files um, where I, I need to investigate further. You know, it helps you find the needle in the haystack. I've got another example um, where we used, I was working with the GW program on extremism that had downloaded um, chat transcripts from Telegram, where I guess people involved in terrorism had had their conversations and they were interested in studying um, the links that people put into those chat transcripts and where they're linking out to. Um, and you know, it's just a big blob of text. So it's not only pulling out the links, but even turning that blob of text into data um, you'd also like to associate dates with the sections of the chat transcript. And the only way to do that was that every so often there's like, when, when it, I guess, turns to a new day, the chat transcript includes a, a date. It'll say like Thursday, July 1st. So you have to look for the regular expression to match on those dates as, while you're parsing through that. And I can actually share some of that code um, it's, it's on GitHub and I'll also, if I can find it, share a link to the paper that came out of that. So there's a link for finding URLs, a, a regular expression for URLs and a regular expression for um, finding dates. And there might've been a couple other ones. So that was kind of a fun URL regular ex or regular expression exercise. Okay, well, great. Well, thanks again, Garrett. If there are no other questions, we can um, come back together as a bigger group. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left and we had talked about having this part of the end of each week being uh, more of an opening network, sharing of ideas, sharing of any challenges that you might be having where you could bring code and say, this isn't working. Can anyone help me figure out why? Um, so we'll turn it over just to an open discussion at this point um, where we can talk about whatever people have of interest. Everyone's really quiet. <laughs> I have something of interest. John, why are you sitting at a standing desk? Because you got to go up and down. That's the whole thing. You, you can't just stand the whole time. You got to take breaks, change it up. In like 10 minutes, I'm going to stand back up. I use timers. Oh. Uh, yeah. That's yeah Garrett uses the balance board technique. Mine broke. <laughs> I broke my balance board, but yeah, I used to have a really ridiculous setup. I had a reclining desk, so I built uh, one of those like cheap sort of like a beach recliner things, and I built a desk that the monitor comes over you, so you can lay back and like type. Great for your shoulders, but it turns out it sort of slowly weakens the rest of your body because you're laying down like a slug. So it wasn't really it wasn't really great. I went back to a standing desk. It's kind of like Wally. It was exactly like Wally. That was my inspiration for it. 
Um, but uh, very comfortable, pretty bad for you in the end. Um, yeah, this, this, the regex thing is sort of a, I have a love hate relationship with it. I don't, I think most people do. I don't know. It's a, it's one of those things that when I look at it, like if you just took any of those examples you showed, it's like the most difficult thing to immediately read. I have to stop and like look at every letter and try to figure out, wait, did I get this wrong? Oh no, I missed a dot there. And, and it's, it's very frustrating, but um, it's super powerful. So you just gotta embrace it and spend the time being really tedious and then it helps you a lot. Um, I use a bunch of libraries. Well, in R, I use the whole tidyverse thing to help me get through a lot of the stuff I want to do with just basic functions, like search for this thing, search for this. Um, and I can avoid using regex to some degree. But when I do like web scraping or something, it's kind of have to go there because the stuff you get back from the web is very messy, lots of messy strings. And Elizabeth has a question too. Hi, I'm new to programming in Python and one of the things that we're studying is how to know the difference between um, global and local variables. So coming from a beginner's viewpoint, visually, how do you know the difference between the two? So the easiest way that I think about this issue is that anytime you're just uh, defining a variable, so let's say, you know, you have, I'm looking at the code I had right now and it says full text equals, you know, something, right? So I have something that I saved as full text. That's a global variable. Okay, I've just, by default, any variable you save is gonna be a global variable. But when you define a variable inside of something like a for loop or a function or a class, those variables that are defined within those things are local variables. They only exist within uh, the domain of that class or that function. So when you're done writing, running that function, or when you start, let's say you call a function, you call a function and that function is going to create these local variables, use the local variables and return an output. Once it has returned the output, the local variables are gone. They don't exist. They don't persist. Um, a global variable uh, that's defined outside of the function will just exist and persist uh, consistently through memory until the until the until you delete it or you restart the kernel or something. So I think the easiest way to think about it is is it is it defined in a function, a for loop, uh, or a class? Then it's going to be a local variable or something like that. It's going to be a local variable. But if you just have it just straight up defined, not inside of anything else, it's going to be a global variable. So hopefully. So how about that code that you were using in Regex? Can you pull that back up and visually yeah. show the the, the differences, like which one switch? Yep, let's find. Thank you. Okay, can you see this? Yes. So right here, this full text, this is an example of a global variable. And you'll find that exists right over here. Um, but if I was to make a, let's say, I think this is a code sub, yeah. So if I said, I make a function called function, and the function is going to take in a variable x, and we're gonna take x, and we're gonna add, let's say two to it, and save it to y. And then I'm gonna take, let's say, another variable z, and I'm going to make that y, I'm gonna add three to it, and I'm gonna return, let's say, z. Okay, so I make this function, and then I say, Let's say out is going to be our function. And then I'm going to input one into here. Okay, so I run this. And then uh, let's. So right here, out is now a global variable. See how it exists right here under these global, this global variable tab? Yes. Okay, it gave me the output, which was one. I add two and I add three to it. That gives me six. Y and Z are local variables. They're defined inside of the function. And they don't persist after the execution of the function. So you don't see a Y and Z in here. 
Okay, but I could, if I were to just run this, let's say in another cell, we say like so, I end up with uh, Z, which is six, I get the same thing, but now I should have X, Y, and Z here. These are all global variables. So the, the material for our class said to use global variables with caution because of the consequences, because they don't change. Yeah. So does that mean that typically any program of whatever size, typically there aren't that many global variables? Um, I would, yeah, I would say, um, I would say typically you try to, typically you go down two main paths in Python um, with most people leaning towards an objective oriented path. So in Python, you can typically program functionally or you can program objectively. So in an objective programming world, you define classes and then you manipulate those classes. In a functional world, you define functions and manipulate those functions. So I just made a function here. Um, the reason I'm pointing that out is that if in my program, if I have a whole bunch of these functions, I'm using all local variables. And so I'm not defining a whole bunch of global variables like this, that I'm going to, you know, write a whole bunch of code and have the potential to overwrite one of those variables or have one of them take up like a ton of RAM, right? Because if you keep these global variables, they just stay in memory. And so if you're writing a big program and you're handling a lot of big data, uh, you don't want to be exhausting your uh, plausibly limited memory store. Okay, that's, so that's awesome. Yeah. Well, and the other advantage too is you don't want to accidentally use X, Y, or Z later on and have them been defined globally and then mess everything up. Um, so the local has that advantage of you don't have to worry about that confusion later on. I would say my two cents on this is that when you hear an instructor say, be careful with global variables, um, my, my general statement I say is that you, you want functions or methods or, uh, to give the same output for the same input. And that's what, where global variables can like wreck things. So if you make a function that does something, I give it five, it gives me a number back I should always get that number back if I give it five. Every time I give it five, that output should never change. Um, and if you are using global variables inside the function, then your output might change because you could change that ver that variable out there in memory and your function is going to possibly do something different. Um, that's, that's one area where, and at least with my students, I'm always trying to emphasize like avoid using any sort of global variable inside your function try to use things that are only sort of given as arguments to the function or inputs so that stuff won't the the, the function won't do funny behavior um same input should give you same input output that's that's my sort of goal Okay, thank you. And then, um, Garrett, will you make this recording available? So um, it looks like excellent information that I'd like to revisit when I, you know, when I know a little bit more. Uh, yeah, I mean, who's... Yeah, so we're making the recordings of each of these groups available. Yeah. Um, there'll be a link in the Slack channel for it, and it will end up on the website. Um, and also the deep note notebook, as long as he doesn't get rid of it, it will be there and you can go in and you can copy his notebook over if you want to play with it. I wanna play with it in his, though you do have that capability. Um, but you can copy over his notebook and play with it yourself, break it, see what works, try to fix it again. Um, it's a good way to learn. Yeah, so, and if you want to look at my screen again, I don't know if it's still up, but I just put together a quick little example about 
that demonstrates why all this can go wrong, just as John pointed out. I mean, if you look at this y variable, if this y variable is defined somewhere at the beginning of the function, or sorry, at the beginning of the code, um, if I just by changing this, I'm getting these different outputs to this exact same function. Um, because this y variable is a global variable that persists. And when it comes into this function, it exists right here, um, but it's not being defined inside of the function, which will cause you potentially problems. Great. Thanks for bringing the question. Anyone else with thoughts, things you want to share, um, challenges you're facing? Did we want to try to break off in things or not? This was something we've been discussing. Yeah, um, maybe not today because we only have four minutes. Yeah. But I guess so we can ask the group what they think. So one of the ideas that John and I had was for this last part after the presentation, um, if it would be useful to break into maybe two groups, we were thinking like we could have one group that's more people who are just getting started. Um, and then if there's a group of people who are more advanced, um, I mean, if people wanted to talk about Dask with Garrett, for example, and talk about parallel processing in Python, then that might be beyond where most of the rest of us are but they should have a space, we thought, to have those conversations too. Um, but we weren't sure how the group felt about potentially doing that, to break into smaller groups um, to talk about things. The idea would be to just set up a few breakout rooms and send you off to rooms, because that's the only thing we can sort of do uh, virtually it's much easier in a room to go go over there and talk to Garrett go over here and talk to us or whatever um, I think it's a good idea yeah yeah I mean this is a collective group of people from all over GW and all different skill levels um so and different languages all these things so we're okay we're getting positives on that so that's good um so we're trying to think about what groups would make sense I mean we could do it topically like this and like the example Ryan just said and this week since Garrett you know knows Dask so well we could say okay we're one option is go off with Garrett and talk about Dask um so I, I, we're probably going to end up having something where whoever's sort of doing the show and tell for the, the week uh will go off and go on maybe more detail there and we could have another group that goes off and talks about general things like stuff like we're just doing like general issues around programming of any kind um like the local global variable question that kind of thing so that's uh we don't know yet you know how to organize these groups but in zoom you have to sort of set uh a fixed number of rooms and so far i have not found a feature where you can self-select into the group so you have to sort of tell me where you want to go and i can send you there so it's a little bit of a friction to make that happen but i think maybe next week if we have uh, time, I'll give a few uh, topics and then everyone can just sort of in the chat window say, hey, send me here, send me to room one or two and I'll, I'll throw you over there and then you guys can chat. Well, good. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for joining for week two of uh, GW Coders. Uh, we'll stop counting and then it'll just be an ongoing thing. Um, so hopefully this is useful. Um, again, we want to build networks and connections. Please feel free to invite others. Um, if they can't make it to the Friday meetups, there is the Slack group where they can also keep aware of what's going on, get announcements here about events going on, connect with people um, individually. So if you have specific questions for others that you've heard talk in the group, Slack would be the best way to make those connections. So have a great week, everyone, and um, 
talk to you next Friday. Awesome. Talk to you guys Bye. later. Thanks again, Garrett. Thanks, Garrett. Of course. Bye, everyone. <laughs>